So today's video is going to be my first video back in 2020 and I'm sorry it's coming so late but as I'm sure you can tell from the background everything is not normal <laughs> in my life right now. I wanted to come back in 2020. I did take a break on purpose but the break has been longer than I originally wanted it to be. So I took a break to improve my channel, just to improve my quality, improve my research quality, improve my video quality, my audio quality, everything. Improve the background. This is not supposed to be the background. Um, but everything has gone wrong <laughs> all at once. I'm so lucky. I ordered a new camera, I ordered a new lens, I ordered a new microphone, they were all wrong <laughs> so i've had to order new ones of each thing the background i've got to wait a couple days for some more things to come i'm having a nice new little background but it hasn't been wasted time that i've not been here on youtube i've got so many cases um backlog researched so i haven't been filming i haven't been like editing like physically doing youtube but i've been researching getting ready to get back in front of the camera so just for this video and i think probably my next video we're gonna be in this <laughs> in this really nice setup that out of the way thank you for being so patient with me by the way so today we're gonna be talking about a case that is physically very close to home for me so if you follow me on social media and stuff you'll know that i live in leeds in west yorkshire in the uk and this case takes place in leeds today we're going to be talking about anthony morley also known as mr gay uk you'll understand why he's nicknamed that in a minute but before we get into this case i just want to thank our sponsors nordvpn nordvpn is a service that allows you to protect your information online from people trying to access it and hackers on the internet. It works by giving you a different IP address from somewhere else in the world, making it seem like you're operating somewhere else. And this different IP address acts as a barrier between these horrible people trying to access your information and you keeping it all safe. And because this IP address can be from somewhere else in the world, NordVPN have over 60 countries to choose from. That means that you can access content that is specific to that country. So different countries, Netflix, different YouTube videos that might be blocked in your country. You can watch them using a VPN for a different country. It's been recent news that Studio Ghibli are putting all their films on Netflix, but not in the US and Canada. So if you wanna watch those and you're in the US, an odd VPN would be a way to get around that. I've said it before, but if you're using public Wi-Fi, like fast food restaurants, coffee shops, libraries, I would really recommend using a VPN because you don't know how secure those networks are that you're logging onto. And NordVPN are kindly offering you guys 70% off of your subscription, making it just $3.49 a month, plus a whole month free added on. To take advantage of that deal, you can go through my link, which is down in the description, just nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, use the code Eleanor at checkout, and there you go, huge discount. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. And before I get into this case, I would just like to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this case. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So yeah, like I said, this case takes place in Leeds, which is in West Yorkshire in the north of England. It took place in 2008, but before we get into the actual crime, let's have a little bit of a backstory on the killer. His name was Anthony Morley and for some reason researching this case was so hard because there's not that much information out there on this case which I find baffling because this is so interesting. This is the kind of case that you would expect documentaries and series and dramas to be based on but there's really not that much, especially about his like childhood and upbringing. Anthony Morley was born in 1972 in the north of England, I believe in South Yorkshire, but I can't be too sure on that. I'm pretty sure it was some region of Yorkshire though because I think he had a Yorkshire accent. And from what I could find in my research was that he had a pretty uneventful childhood. There were no major incidents or major you know, people in his life that influenced how he would grow up. He just had a very similar childhood to a lot of people growing up in that kind of time. Although Anthony had been very good looking all his life, he was just kind of 
physically blessed with his face like all the way through school teenage years early adulthood like he always attracted a lot of attention from his peers they all thought he was really good looking and when he was in his late teens he realized that he could take advantage of this and he began modeling now he started off quite small and then kind of worked his way up to like bigger campaigns, magazines. And during this time, Anthony began figuring out his sexuality. He always knew that he was attracted to men, but he was just trying to figure out if it was just men or men and women. He would refer to himself as gay a lot, but then when people would want to talk to him about it, it'd be like, oh no, I'm straight. However, one thing you'll notice is that he never used the term bi or pansexual or, you know, he was, he either went by gay or straight, he never wanted to give himself a label in the middle somewhere and I, I don't want to sit here and speculate his sexuality but he did have relationships with both men and women in his life. Not that it's too important to the case but it does get a little bit more important later on and it seemed as though he really did want to label it. I know a lot of people don't like to put a label on their sexuality which is totally fine but it seemed as though Anthony really did want to label it but he just didn't know. As his modelling career began taking off he began branching out into different things but kind of in the same vein so he would do pageants, he would go on like kind of entertainment TV shows, just things that were very kind of looks based, like things that wanted attractive people to be a part of it, Anthony was there. Although his ultimate dream in life was to become a dancer, although he didn't take many steps to get there, I think once he got into the modelling industry and kind of entertainment that way, he put this dream to the back of his mind. It was always there, he always wanted to be a dancer, but it's not like he was actively you know, going to dance classes and taking dance jobs. He was just taking any job that he liked the sound of. In 1993, when Anthony Morley was 21 years old, he entered the first ever Mr. Gay UK contest. I don't really know how to describe Mr. Gay UK because it's kind of like part beauty pageant, part talent show, part dance contest. It's from what I could see anyway, I've never been to one, I've never like seen it live in action so I can't tell you exactly what goes on but I believe it's like a mixture of all those things but just for gay men in the UK. And the grand prize of this competition, the winner of Mr Gay UK would win £1,000 and a holiday to Gran Canaria. Men would apply from all over the UK in their local gay clubs so there were about 14 clubs all over the UK and you would just go to your nearest one if you wanted to apply for this and they would do mini contests in each of the local clubs and a winner would be found for each city or each club and then the winners of all of those 14 clubs would meet up in London at the famous gay club Heaven and there they would battle it out for Mr Gay UK, the proper title. So Anthony Morley went to his local gay club in Doncaster in South Yorkshire and he signed himself up and he won his mini contest in the Doncaster club which meant he travelled all the way down to London and competed against 13 other winners from around the UK and Anthony Morley actually won. The first ever one of its kind. This was the first ever Mr Gay UK that has been put on. Since then it's been on every single year up until about 2014 I think. I think it's stopped now. But yeah winning this title led to so many more opportunities for Anthony. He was in pride parades all over Europe, all over the UK. It led to opportunities in modelling and advertising, dancing, just a lot of random things in the entertainment industry as well like game shows which you'll see in a second and Anthony was getting so many offers and opportunities all at once that he wanted to make the most of this and make this a lasting career for himself. So he moved from Yorkshire all the way down to London and became a full-time entertainer, model, you know, doing odd little entertainment jobs and one of these odd little entertainment jobs that would be very important to Anthony Morley's life and this case was a particular TV show, a game show named God's Gift. God's Gift was a very <laughs> strange British game show that was aired in 1995 and 1996. It's no wonder that this show was cancelled after two years. It was hosted by Davina McCall, 
weirdly enough, and voiced over by Jimmy Savile. It doesn't sound real, but keep with me. And instead of it airing on like, you know, a Saturday night, Friday night, Sunday night, you know, peak times, this show was aired at 3 a.m. on a Thursday night and 3 a.m. again on a Sunday night. Well, early hours of the morning. But surprisingly, it was kind of popular in the beginning because people would get home from nights out on a Saturday night and they would just sit drunk in the living room and make fun of this show. No one took God's gift seriously as an entertainment show in the UK. It would be men getting home from the pub just laughing at the contestants on this show. Basically, all the contestants were male. So there were five men that would go on this show every single week that believed that they were God's gift. Not literally, but you know the saying, God's gift. It's someone that's really vain and they believe that they are, you know, it. They think they've got it. And so five men that thought that they were God's gift all came together on this show every week to battle it out and see who was God's gift. So the challenges that these men would do on this show were strip teasers, random challenges, like showing off skills, question rounds where like the audience would talk to them and vote a winner and stuff. Each show had a live audience and then at the end of the episode the live audience would vote which of the five men they think is the sexiest and he would win. The live audience on God's Gift was usually all women, but every so often they would have a gay special where the audience would be full of gay men and the five contestants would also be gay men. And at the end of each episode, when one man was crowned God's Gift, they would find a member of the audience that they think is the sexiest and they would ask them out on a date and then it would be filmed and put in at the end of the episode, this date. Kind of like dinner date kind of situation. Well, one day Anthony Morley landed a role on this show. He was one of the five contestants that thought he was God's gift. And I'm so mad because I can't find footage of this episode at all on the internet, which is kind of understandable. Although there are a couple of clips online of another episode of God's gift, which is almost equally as important to this case as Anthony's episode was. However, in Anthony Morley's episode of God's Gift, he actually won. He was crowned God's Gift by the audience, which meant that he got to pick one of the men in the audience to take out on a date. Now, I don't know who he picked, but it was another person in the audience that didn't catch Anthony's eye at the time that would later become a huge part of this case. 21 year old Damien Oldfield was a member of the interactive audience that day and just like every single other man there he found 24 year old Anthony very attractive. Damien wasn't picked for the date that day, Anthony chose someone else and I don't know if the two of them even knew each other at the moment or if this was just a coincidence that they were on the same show, in the same room and then later on in life would become so important to each other. Damien himself actually went on the show later on that year and he also won his episode and he took a random man from the audience on a date and there are clips of that episode on the internet that you can find on YouTube. Just type in like Damien Oldfield, God's Gift and random clips of his episode will come up. But the two men at this point, I don't think they knew each other. However, they had been in the same room at one point. And for the next almost decade, the two of them went about their lives, you know, living and seeing other people. And then as Anthony Morley was getting older, he was reaching his late twenties, early thirties, his entertainment and modeling jobs were quickly dying down because he didn't have the looks and the body that he once had that made him so appealing to all these brands. And over the course of like a year or two, the money just went like that. It declined so quickly. And so Anthony could no longer afford to live in London. It's so expensive to live in the capital. And so he decided to move back to Leeds, his 
hometown or near enough his hometown. Meanwhile, Damien Oldfield also lived in Leeds, which is a rather large coincidence. In his life, he'd taken the kind of journalism advertising route. He worked for the game magazine Bent, which was mainly distributed in Leeds. And the company that he worked for that owned this magazine also owned the nightclub Mission in Leeds and also owned the Mr Gay UK brand which is also a huge coincidence. But yeah, Damien mainly worked for the magazine. He was an advertising manager and so he would kind of determine what adverts went where in the magazine but then occasionally he would have a hand at like advertising the nightclub and stuff like that. So for a little bit about Damien, he was a very very friendly and outgoing and kind of you know out there person. He was one of those people that will make you feel welcome. Like the second you walk into the party he's over by you, he's making friends and his mother says that within five minutes of meeting Damien you would class him as one of your friends. He's that easy to get along with. Meanwhile it in that time that Damien was very focused on his job and the magazine and the nightclub and the Mr Gay UK brand, Anthony Morley had been further in his career. Now he'd decided to move from entertainment and modelling and things like that and he decided to go into cooking. He was a chef now. He started off quite low in the kitchen, like just doing all the little jobs that all the big chefs wanted him to do. But over the years he worked his way up and eventually became a sous chef specialising in seafood. Both Anthony and Damien would regularly attend gay nightclubs and gay events in the Leeds area in the early 2000s which led to them two meeting each other and forming a relationship. They began seeing each other for a little while but then eventually broke things off because like I said Anthony all his life just had issues come into terms with his sexuality like one minute he thought he was straight and he was okay with that and he would get into relationships with women and then all of a sudden he'd have this thing come over him where he's like I don't like women I like men and he would get out of this relationship and the same would happen with men he would find a man that he really liked and he really got on with really connected with and then all of a sudden he would freak out and think I'm not gay I don't like men I'm straight and he would break things off. He had a very hard time communicating this with his partners. I think he just had a hard time in general communicating this to himself. I don't think he ever really labelled it and I don't think he needed to but he himself in his brain thought he needed to. So yeah Damien and Anthony broke things off and then in April of 2008 they reconnected. They met again at a nightclub or an event or something like that and they hit it off again and they started seeing each other again. When he lived in London and then I believe in the early stages of him moving back to Leeds, he actually had a five year relationship with another man and a three year relationship with another woman. And on the very rare occasions that he would open up to friends and family about his sexuality, he would express a longing to just be normal. And whenever anyone would bring up Mr Gay UK, so when he would have doubts about his sexuality and say that he was straight, people would say, well, you were on Mr Gay UK, you were gay then, why aren't you gay now? He would say, oh, well, I wasn't gay then, I was straight the whole time, I was just pretending because I knew I could win. And he would say that he had a girlfriend while he was in that kind of pageant show thing and he was just doing it for the prize money and for the holiday because he knew he could win it. Although at other points in his life he would admit to having an older um, boyfriend, sugar daddy type relationship when he was in his late teens, early 20s. He was seeing this older man that would buy him things and take him out and pay him for certain favours. So yeah, I'm not trying to label his sexuality for him or anything at any point in this video, just to put that out there, but I'm just trying to gather all the kind of sides of this. But yeah, like I said, he always seemed to go between gay and straight. I couldn't find any evidence of him ever identifying as bisexual, pansexual, anything kind of in the middle of those two you know, sides of the spectrum. He only ever wanted to label himself one of those two and even then he didn't <laughs> really label himself one of those two. Around this point in his 20s and his early 30s, Anthony Morley became an alcoholic. Now psychologists have put this down to potentially two triggers. 
in his life. The first being him desperately wanting to decide his sexuality and to label it so much so that he turned to alcohol to kind of suppress that and take his mind off that and psychologists have also put the alcoholism down to his failing modeling career maybe he felt as though he never really achieved his full potential maybe he was sad that he had to let that life go and also the dancer thing as well like i said his ultimate career goal was to be a dancer but he never really took the steps to get there he never took dance classes never you know did dance auditions much um and i think he kind of realized that you know dancers are in their physical prime when they're in their younger years late teens early 20s and i think he was realizing that now not that it was too late, but he'd kind of wasted his prime years not doing what he really wanted to do. So yeah, he turned to alcohol and alcohol really changed Anthony Morley. When he had a drink, he became mean. He was mean, he was violent, he was aggressive, he was jealous, which when he was in a relationship that really did not gel well with his lifestyle because he would become so irritable and it ended a lot of his relationships did his alcoholism. I was saying that he had a five year relationship with a man earlier in his life and that actually came to an end one night when Anthony Morley was drinking and he and his boyfriend got into an argument and Anthony pulled a meat cleaver on him. This argument was about money. It was something that a lot of couples do argue about and his boyfriend said that they had this argument and then they were just sat on the sofa watching TV. Like the argument had stopped, they'd stopped talking to each other and they were just sat in silence watching TV and he thought the argument was over. But then the boyfriend says that Anthony Morley got up off the sofa went into the kitchen for a few seconds and then came back in and sat on the sofa again. So the boyfriend didn't think much of it. They were sat there for another five minutes just in silence watching TV and then all of a sudden Anthony Morley leaps up with a meat cleaver in his hand and begins threatening his boyfriend. Luckily Anthony lost his footing because like I say he was drunk and he fell backwards allowing his boyfriend at the time to run outside and run to safety somewhere and call the police. So his boyfriend ran to a phone, I think he went to a neighbour's house or something, called police and an ambulance because he feared that Anthony Morley inside would have probably hurt himself. So the ambulance arrives, police arrive, the ambulance actually gets there first and Anthony Morley is stood in the window of the bedroom upstairs shooting at the ambulance with an air rifle. Another time when Anthony was drunk at a bar, he threatened a man grabbing him by his jumper, by the neck of his jumper and saying that he could kill this man with his bare hands. Anthony was kind of a notoriously bad drunk in the Leeds gay scene. Everyone that went to those kind of clubs on those kind of nights knew to stay away from Anthony Morley when he'd had a drink. On April 23rd, so they reconnected in the April, so this was still very fresh, Anthony and Damien were texting and Anthony said, would you like to come over to my house tonight? I'll cook you a nice meal, we can have a few drinks, but on one condition, is that we take it slow. He expressed his concerns about his sexuality, he's still coming to terms with it, he's still not 100% secure in it and so he didn't want Damien to rush him or force him to, you know, do anything or come to terms with anything and Damien said no that's completely fine and they agreed to see each other on the 23rd. And then just a few hours later at 2.30am in the morning a local takeaway had the shock of their lives when a man stumbled through the front door in a white robe, white flip-flops and covered in blood and it was Anthony Morley. Anthony stumbles in covered in blood and tells the guy behind the counter to call the police. Now there's conflicting reports on Anthony's exact quote because I'm assuming the guy behind the counter didn't remember this word for word because you'd be confused, you'd be scared, you'd your adrenaline would be so high, it's hard to remember things word for word. So one of the quotes that I found that Anthony said when he walked inside this takeaway was, it's this lad, 
He tried to rape me, so I stopped him. Another quote I found that Anthony might have said in that moment was, I've killed someone, call the police. Someone tried to rape me, so I killed that person. What have I done? So police arrived at the scene and arrested Anthony Morley immediately and took him to the police station while other police went inside the flats and nothing could have prepared those police officers for what they were about to find. The first thing they noticed when they walked inside the flat was that it was just covered in blood. And I mean, they did kind of expect this from the state of Anthony. You would expect the flat to also be covered in blood. They walked in and they found the body of 33 year old Damien Oldfield lying on the bedroom floor. And it was in a terrible physical, state. There were bones and flesh and muscle just exposed everywhere because his skin had been like hacked at and cut off in places. Although I do believe all his limbs were still connected to his body. It was just the the skin and the flesh itself that had been cut from him. Not all of it. He did still have quite a bit of skin attached to his body but there were certain parts where it was clear that Anthony had, you know, intentionally cut large chunks from. Police called crime scene investigators who came to have a look at the whole flat. Meanwhile, Damien Oldfield's body was taken for an autopsy. The autopsy found that Damien was most likely attacked from behind and possibly didn't know that he was about to be attacked. The first thing that happened to him was that his throat was slit and this cut his jugular vein and caused him to bleed a lot. That would have been, you know, enough to kill him as it was, but Anthony didn't stop there. He'd then been stabbed over 30 times in the back, in the chest, in the thigh, in the kind of throat, neck area. Damien was missing a rather large chunk of skin and flesh from his thigh, like 30 centimetres by 15 centimetres and it was cut very messily. On his chest, a very similar sized chunk had also been cut, like right on his pectoral and Anthony Morley had actually placed a credit card over where Damien's nipple would have been. Now police never found out why he did that and this is one of the parts that interests me most about this case is that there must be some kind of symbolism, some kind of significance, some kind of meaning behind that. Who thinks to put a credit card on the top of a piece of flesh that you have just cut off? Like, why a credit card, of all things? But as you will see later on in this case, it's unlikely that we're ever going to find out why Anthony Morley did certain things, because he claims that he doesn't remember this attack. We'll get more onto that towards the end of the case, but as for the credit card, I don't know whether it was Anthony's credit card or whether it was Damien's own credit card that he'd like brought with him in his wallet and Anthony had gone to the trouble to take it out of his wallet and put it on his own wound. Like, I feel like that, if I knew whose credit card it was, there could be some kind of significance in that, but I couldn't find that. As for the crime scene, you could tell just by looking around, just by looking at the walls, just by looking at the floors, that this murder and the aftermath had been brutal. Professionals have said that there doesn't seem to be any signs of struggle from Damien, which aligns with the autopsy that says he was attacked from behind. However, this does contradict the the rape claim from Anthony Morley. So Anthony Morley says that he did this because Damien tried to rape him. Now, the autopsy says that Damien didn't know that he was being attacked. And I don't want to kind of say that Anthony's lying about, you know, sexual assault at any point in this. Please don't take it like that. But as, you know, like an objective, unbiased reporter on things like this. I've got to look at it from all angles. And of course, Damien's not here to defend himself from these claims, so I mean, I've kind of got to argue both sides. Crime scene investigators said that there was no evidence that sexual activity had taken place. Now, that is one thing I don't understand. How can you tell? Because supposedly, Anthony said that Damien was trying to perform oral sex on him. How is that something you can tell by looking at the crime scene? I could maybe understand if it was penetrative sex because there could possibly, you know, by looking at the body, the human body, you can tell whether it's been 
forcibly penetrated or not, but with oral sex, is there a way of telling? I don't know. Again, we'll get back to that in a minute and the sexual assault claims, but let's carry on talking about the actual crime scene. In the kitchen, crime scene investigators walked in to find a half-cooked and half-eaten meal on the side and then they looked on the kitchen side and saw a chopping board with seven more half-cooked chunks of meat on it. And you guys are probably thinking the exact same as the crime scene investigators were thinking in that moment. They have a body, a dead body, with chunks missing from it and there's raw meat cut up in the kitchen. The likelihood that this was Damien's body was very high and they were very concerned and so they sent those pieces of meat off for testing and it came back that it was human meat. It was flesh from Damien Oldfield's thigh and not only had Anthony Morley cooked the meat, he'd also seasoned it, which is the bit that gets me over everything else in this. He seasoned human meat, he put olive oil in a pan, he cut up fresh herbs, not even something out of a jar. He went to his fridge, he got fresh herbs out, cut them up, put them in this pan and cooked this human meat like it was a, a normal meal. The bits on the chopping board, so like I said there were seven bits on the chopping board and one bit on a plate. Now the bits on the chopping board were kind of raw on the side still, suggesting that Anthony had originally cooked this piece of flesh as one big piece and then taken it out and cut it up thinking that it was done and found that it was raw on the inside still and so he just put the one piece of meat that was found on the plate back into fry. And this chunk that was on the plate, like I said, was half eaten and Anthony lived alone, he didn't have a pet, he didn't have a dog, it must have been him that ate that human flesh. But another smaller chunk was found in the rubbish bin in the kitchen suggesting that Anthony had tried some of this human flesh on the plate and didn't like the taste of it and spat it out in the bin. In retrospect police said that they had noticed a smell when they entered the flat. It smelled like cooking. It smelled like someone was cooking pork, one of the police officers likened it to. He said it wasn't an unpleasant smell like you would expect burning human flesh to be and police had just assumed that Anthony was cooking his dinner. Police found a meat cleaver in the kitchen on the kitchen side and it didn't have that much blood on it. It had a little bit on it but not enough to have been one of the weapons used to kind of dissect Damien's body. It had like grease on it rather than blood and so police determined that this had been the tool used to cut the meat when Anthony had taken it out of the frying pan and decided it wasn't cooked enough. He then cut it up into seven pieces with the meat cleaver. Like I said, Anthony Morley was arrested at the scene and he says, still to this day, that he does not remember killing Damien Oldfield. He says he was in some kind of blind rage this man had just tried to rape him and so he went off and just killed him and then suddenly he woke up from this state, realised what he'd done and gone to the takeaway to confess. So because the only eyewitness of the event says that they don't remember it, police have had to theorise what happened that day and they used text between Anthony and Damien, they used even the contents of Damien's stomach and things like that to determine how that day went. So like I said, that morning Anthony and Damien were texting each other, Anthony invited Damien round for a meal and some drinks and Damien accepted. Anthony said he wanted to take things slow, Damien said yeah that's not a problem and he came round to Anthony's flat where Anthony cooked him a meal of fish which is what he specialised in at the restaurant. They had a few drinks and then they went up to Anthony's bedroom to watch a movie. They watched Brokeback Mountain, they were laid in bed together, cuddling. Bear in mind, they are both drunk at this point and we know how Anthony gets when he is drunk. He gets violent. And Anthony says the next thing he remembers is he'd fallen asleep and he wakes up 
to Damien trying to perform a sex act on him. He describes in that moment waking up and feeling more betrayed than anything else. Of course he's feeling a load of different emotions, like this is a very bad situation to be in, but he just felt really betrayed. This was someone that he'd confided in about his, you know, about how sensitive he was about his sexuality, yet this man had taken advantage of him when he was drunk and asleep. Damien had acted, if all of this is true by the way, Damien had acted supportive and understanding of Anthony's wishes to take it slow, yet Anthony had woken up and, you know, Damien had initiated sex unconsensually. A quote that Anthony said to police was, I remember feeling that he was on top of me doing what he was doing. I felt numb and out of control. I felt uncomfortable and betrayed. We talked about the whole situation and I wasn't comfortable having a sexual relationship when we'd only just got to know each other. Anthony then says he flew into this blind rage and the next thing he remembers, he'd snapped out of it, he was covered in blood, there was, you know, cooked pieces of human flesh in his kitchen and Damien was dead. So he went from waking up from his nap to Damien, you know, sexually assaulting him and then the next thing he remembers, he'd murdered, cooked and eaten him. So he stumbled outside of the house. He knew he had to go and tell someone. He knew he had to confess to this. He stumbled outside of the house and like I said, at this point, it was like 2.30 a.m. Where is open at 2.30 a.m.? Takeaway shops. And so he goes to the closest takeaway because he knew someone was gonna be there for him to confess to and they could call the police. He stumbles in and says that he killed someone. Anthony said that when he was in this episode, he must have gone into a kind of autopilot state because he is a chef. What do chefs do when they are confronted with a dead carcass? They cut it up, they cook it, and they eat it. He told police, at some point, Damien's body had just become something I would deal with at work, a piece of meat. That's the only thing I can think of. That was my daily task preparing meat. Some police have doubted that Anthony really was in this kind of psychotic episode. I don't want to say psychotic episode because some people tell me it's not a psychotic episode but I don't know how to word that. You know when you're just completely not thinking straight and you're in some kind of episode. Some police don't believe that to be true. They believe Anthony is just saying that just to try and get a lesser sentence. Some officials, like I said, have even doubted that Anthony was sexually assaulted by Damien. And I don't really want to comment on that much because that's a very sensitive topic. Obviously it's a two-sided story and one of those people is no longer here to give their side. So I don't want to comment on it too much, but I just want to let you know that it's there and it's in this case. Some people believe it, some people don't. Other professionals believe that Anthony could have if the sexual assault story is true, that this could have triggered a kind of PTSD flashback episode for Anthony because he claims he was also sexually abused when he was a teenager. If that is the case, it would explain the loss of memory of the attack because that tends to happen quite often in those kind of episodes. It would also explain the dissociative state that he was in when he did it. I don't know much about like PTSD flashbacks and how that affects your body, but that's what I read in my research. As part of this kind of like court hearing and everything to see if Anthony was actually mentally unstable, he saw a psychiatrist and this psychiatrist said that there was no sign of mental illness in Anthony at all. And he never mentioned any kind of flashbacks, any kind of PTSD. And of course, if you're having a psychiatric assessment, they ask you if you've ever been through anything like that. And Anthony didn't say anything. The psychiatrist said they didn't think he um, dissociated or anything like that. He didn't explain any other symptoms of PTSD or any other symptoms of any mental illness. He just had the memory loss, which is convenient. So back to the police theory, it is believed that Anthony, like I said, initially slit Damien's throat from behind. And then when Damien fell to the floor, Anthony got down with him and began stabbing him 30 times in the chest, in the back, in the thigh, in the kind of neck 
area. One thing that I personally question in this case that I haven't seen many people question online, so I don't know if there is an answer out there somewhere, but why was there a knife on the bedside table for Anthony to just pick up? You know, if the sexual assault story is real and he'd just woken up from a nap, and this man was sexually assaulting him, why was there just a random knife or a blade or something on the bedside table for him to attack him with? And how did he do it from behind? I don't know because this case as well seems like something that was planned in advance. I mean, he cut a chunk out of this man's thigh, cut it up, seasoned it and cooked it and then ate a little bit of it. That seems, that sounds like a fantasy that someone, like a sick fantasy that someone has had for a long time. And maybe this murder was premeditated. Maybe Anthony invited Damien over that day because he wanted to kill him and cook him and try human flesh. And maybe that is why a knife just so happened to be on the bedside table. Maybe he'd put it there in preparation for this. In October of 2008, all of this information was presented to a jury who took just two hours and 20 minutes to come to the decision that Anthony Morley was guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years mainly due to the aftermath of the murder. The murder itself was horrifically brutal and would have got him a very high sentence, but the aftermath just showed a, a depraved mind. This went way beyond self-defense, like Anthony claimed. You, if you're killing someone in self-defense, you don't then cook them and eat them. Anthony Morley is still currently in prison in Leeds where he is rumored to be working as a chef. You know how they get like inmates to do jobs around the prison? He's a chef cooking food for his fellow inmates. There's a couple of motives for this murder. There is, you know, the one that Anthony claims that he was doing it in self-defense because Damien was sexually assaulting him. There is my own personal theory that maybe this was premeditated. Maybe Anthony just had a sick fantasy that he wanted to try human flesh. Other professionals believe that maybe his motive was his sexuality, his hidden hatred or confusion with his own sexuality. We don't know exactly how he felt because he doesn't talk about it openly. Professionals believe that maybe Anthony saw Damien as a reflection of his own homosexuality. He was a gay man in his bed and maybe in that moment, Anthony, something came over him and he suddenly felt ashamed that he's invited this man round for a romantic relationship. Maybe something took over him and he attacked Damien. Maybe it wasn't personal to Damien. Anthony was attacking a part of himself just kind of taking that out on Damien. But yeah, that completes this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you wanna see some more from me. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. If you wanna snatch up that amazing deal of 70% off plus one month free, make sure you go into my link, nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor and use code Eleanor at checkout. The link to do that is down below in the description. A huge thank you to all of my channel members, all of their names are on screen right now. If you want to become a channel member, you can click the link in the description or click the join button if you're on a desktop. There's two tiers to choose from. Everyone on tiers one and two will get access to a community page where you can suggest cases and get your requests fast tracked. And exclusive to tier two members, they will get their name on this end screen at the end of every single video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.